The Chelsea boss was chuffed to reveal, said the news report, that the club had captured the world's greatest striker from Liverpool in a five and a half year, 50 million pound deal. Carlo's over the moon, they said, he said. He's over the moon, they said. The Hollywood mum was way beyond thrilled, according to friends, when she delivered into the world not one bouncing baby, but twins instead to the astonished dad. And I'm over the moon, they said, she said. I'm over the moon, she said. Bollywood's hottest couple was proud to be blessed by the jubilant father, the superstar. It's a match made in heaven, he said to the press, between two shooting stars with shining careers. And I'm over the moon, of course, he said. I'm over the moon, he said. The Malaysian nation went mad with joy on Independence Day in its 50th year, when a doctor come part-time model, a local boy went up into space in a Russian Soyuz and in zero gravity performed his namaz. All of Malaysia over the moon, they said on the news. 27 million people over the moon. You must have noticed. It's really quite clear. This condition has spread. It's happening there. It's happening here. It's full blown, grown beyond every border to the furthest corner of every country where English is spoken or English is known. There's no one just satisfied or mildly pleased or chipper or chirpy, contented or cheerful. No one glad or gratified, delighted or jubilant, elated, ecstatic, joyful or gleeful. All the happy people have left this world. You won't come across them anytime soon. And if it's happy sound bites you're looking for, you need to look way over your head for the words and balloons to the place where the cow keeps jumping over and over with all the footballers, team managers and lottery winners, world superstars, heroes and champions and legends and lovers and proud mums and dads and the whole of Malaysia <laughs> over the moon, over the moon, over the, over the, over the moon. <laughs> I just had fun with that one. Um, so English is abused and misused, but used in all parts of the world. This one's called Stolen English. Someone came by moonlight and lifted it from under our noses. We never heard a thing. It was smuggled on a ship to Boston, entered Cornpore through improper channels. This pilfering has been going on for years. Creole, Yankee, Hinglish, Pinglish, Singlish. Some foreign cat has got our tongue. You can't keep counting the silver after the guests and hired help have left. One by one, bits disappeared. A fork, a knife, a spoon. They found pieces of it years later in Madras, Whole Town, Kingston, Cameroon. Some cat opened its mouth and used our silver tongue to sing. We were the ones they put in the dock in front of a judge and jury for questioning. Did you never suspect it was happening? Did you look the other way? Why did you not report it missing? This looks to us like an inside job. What have you got to say for yourself, eh? Cat got your tongue? The next one is a kind of love poem, but it seemed to me that so much of what we talk about, so much of when we're describing, thinking about love or loss or longing, so much of it's got to do with time. And we describe it in terms of time. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the train is late, held up for an hour or more on the aimless edge of town. Signals have failed and explanations are being offered. But we are drinking tepid coffee from the trolley 
and it doesn't matter, we agree. It's not as if I am waiting for you or you are waiting for me at the wrong end of a long journey. It's not as if you are on a rainy platform or I am home alone thinking perhaps I should call you on your mobile phone. It's not as if thinking of me waiting, you are trying to call and let me know. No, it's not like that. Our time is stopped. Your arm warms mine. We are, we are sharing a slice of fruitcake and drinking coffee from the same trolley. Time has been held up for us. We look at it this way and that, at its finesse, its endlessness. We admire this time we have as if it were a work of art. Just look at this, time on our hands, time to talk of this and that, your hand in mine. It doesn't matter, you say to me. It doesn't matter if the train is late. The day the marks made sense. When my fingers pushed at the marks, jumbled on a page, and stumbled on the word girl. When I found that every scratch had its own sound, g -e -r -l. I said it in Scottish, girl. That was just the start. Words made stories that flew out of books. Buses had roots and I could read them. Signs spoke to me as if they had voices. I sent messages, word came back. Then the glass blue days began and lived in my house as if they would never crack or break. One day, they said she was old enough to learn some shame. She found it came quite naturally. Bartha is a kind of safety. The body finds a place to hide. The cloth fans out against the skin, much like the earth that falls on coffins after they put the dead men in. People she has known stand up, sit down as they've always done, but they make different angles in the light. Their eyes are slant, a little sly. She half remembers things, from someone else's life, perhaps from yours or mine, carefully carrying what we do not own. Between the thighs, a sense of sin. We sit still, letting the cloth grow a little closer to our skin. A light filters inward through our body's walls. Voices speak inside us echoing in the spaces we have just left. She stands out outside herself, sometimes in all four corners of a room. Wherever she goes, she is always inching past herself, as if she were a clod of earth and the roots as well, scratching for a hold between the first and second rib, passing constantly out of her own hands into the corner of someone else's eyes while doors keep opening inward and again inward. The child sings. The child is thinking nothing. Sometimes she sings notes that cannot find a name. Years pass, and yet it is the same. She comes back. A door opens. Light spills out. Light spills out around her body, draped in black. She is nothing but a crack where the light forgot to shine. Nine items. They say she went shopping that last day and picked up 
Clouds of underwear, armfuls of bras, candy colored, frilled, colored, frilled with hearts and strawberries sewn on, edges pearled. How many garments do you have there? Uncounted hopes, silky wishes unfulfilled. In the mirrors of the fitting room, she took off skirt and shirt and underwear and tried on everything for size. Mirrors must have rippled round her. Her reflection slid off itself like water. When she had seen enough, she gathered up the fallen drifts. Then she left herself on the wooden hanger, handed it over at the door and returned the token as she went. Nine items returned. One more. Any good? No good. Thank you. No. This one is about something that is never or very rarely lost, and that's the Bombay Tiffin Box. <laughs> I don't know if you know about the Tiffin Box. Yes. <laughs> Been to Bombay. <laughs> um, every working day, Bombay's Dabbawalas, or Tiffin Box carriers, deliver hot food made at home to hundreds of thousands of office workers across the city. And uh, they're, all that the, the Tiffin Box carrier has to guide him to the owner is a tiny mark on the lid of the box. And this is taking these boxes across a, a city with trains and handcarts and using his own their own two feet. Uh, they're crossing a city of 19 million people to get this box to the owner. There's no name, address, nothing, just the mark on the box. And with all that, only one box in eight million is ever lost. So I thought that deserved a poem. And the poem's written in the voice of the Tiffin Box. And it's a voice that uses Bombay street slang and a version of English, a Bombay English, which uh, India has sort of appropriated English and made it its own. And as, as we know now, English is just one more of the many Indian languages. <laughs> Dabba's dialogue, or Tiffin Box talks, no place for words, ya. Yeah. Alphabet? Forget. Zara no space on my lid for commonplace. No good name, no home address, no reference number. Tucked in our tintin in VT station, off the local train. All world over knows me by my fame and my lid sign. I arrive before wheel squeal on the track only. 11 o'clock, exact. On the spot, on the dot, tucked in a tintin, dabba comes in. No sala, sala is an interesting word. In most Indian languages it means brother-in-law, but it's commonly used as a swear word. <laughs> <laughs> Can't think why. No sala can break this momentum. Dabba walas, dabbas, handcarts, running, running in formation through chaos. Fata fat, all clatter and hustle. Tiffin box will reach on the dot, on the spot, outside the lift, on the exact floor, where at tiffin time, see Ma Geronimo, Sunil, Patil, Swami Nathanayar are expecting for food hot, hot from the hand of Ma and Mrs. Home Kitchen. <laughs> no need for words, ya. Yeah. No need to speak only. When dal, roti, raita, rice, bindi, bengal, potato and pickle, home food comes damadam in three tiers of a tiffin. No need for love notes, ya. Yeah. This affair is carrying on for a hundred years. Own home in a tin with a kiss on the lid, delivered by a man who never mastered ABC but reads me like his missus face. <laughs> then happiness becomes... Thank you. Thank you.